to answer any questions that you might have. Um, whether it's about the presentation, about Papua New Guinea generally, I'll do my best to answer as many as possible. Um, or uh, you might have a question about what to do in Alata or where to go or how do we get to snorkel on Kitab or whatever it might be. So anyway, if you've got any questions, uh, just feel free and ask. There's a microphone here so the people at the back can hear. If you want to come up and ask a question, that would be great. I'll start off with two of the most common questions that I get asked, or more I get, I get asked is, one, how did you get into this? Um, and the second one is, how much do you get paid? Uh, the first one, the answer to that is volunteer, and the second answer is volunteer. Um, we, uh, I, I've got a presentation on the laptop that I used to do at uh, the likes of Rotary and Lines and, and the other places just to show that. And, we were on a couple of cruises and <clears throat> a lot of sea days. I went to the cruise director and said, you know, we've got this if anybody's interested. Which was very interesting between Vancouver and Hawaii, when the ship's full of Americans and French Canadians, and you asked them if they want to hear about Papua New Guinea, they said, well, where the hell's Papua New Guinea? <laughs> That's the first thing. So anyway, we just started doing that. We got good response from that, and the next thing that happened would be, the people in Sydney from P and O got to hear about us, and they said, "Look, we'd like you to to make a presentation." And we thought, "Oh, yeah, one presentation, get a cruise, no problem." And uh, they said, "No, I want you to do four. <laughs> oh God! So I dog more again for one, and uh, we developed four presentations. And then the more we actually worked at it, we've actually we've got probably ten totally different presentations on our life in Papua New Guinea, living in isolation, and we're actually developing uh, ones about the Northern Territory. We used to be, we uh, lived in Darwin for 10 years, and um, Morag was, uh, anybody that's been to Darwin and know about the Aboriginal organisations in Darwin, uh, Morag was the executive officer for Gullaroy and Pingu for 10 years, and both our sons of uh, being named by Gullaroy's sister, so we've got we've got some presentations about crocodile ceremony and stuff like that, which is it's all in the pipelines. And the other thing about getting paid, oh, we get a cabin, or we get a bed, we get fed, and then we have to pay for everything else. So we drink brandy and dry and coffee. If anybody's interested, <laughs> a question? Anybody got a question? Yes, yes. Yeah, please, then they, they can hear up the back there, if you wouldn't mind. Hi, John. Yeah. Um, do women have to cover parts of their body, or shorts like this is appropriate yeah, you, for you, us to wear? Yeah, that's covering body. No, you're, you're perfectly all right. You can walk in, in shorts. You'll, you'll find that half of the Indians wear a lot less than that. Um, they're, not, they're not particularly worried about it. But you can wear your shorts. You might actually find, if you've got, um, you know, like three quarter length cotton pants, you probably might find they're very more comfortable than, I mean, just, just for the climate more than anything else. But you don't have to wear, no, you can wear, wear them. I mean, you walk around in a bikini, then you, you know, got a few problems, you know. Next. Hi, John. I was told that you bought on Fleet Islands, is that correct? No, no, you talked to the wrong guy. I wish I had his money. <laughs> I did, because that's what I was wondering. <laughs> no, no that, that, that comment that was made earlier in the port presentations about Ian Gary Smith coming on board in Alito and, and making a presentation, I've spoken to a couple of people and they're surprised to hear that. So it, it may or may not happen, but I'll give you the inside gem on Ian Gary Smith if he does come and make a presentation. In, uh, in New South Wales, uh, there is a, a company that started off uh, drying tomatoes. Uh, it's Go, Go's vegetable products, and they, they tinned or bottled dried tomatoes. And that's the Gowrie Smith family. So they're originally um, New South Wales farmers uh, growing vegetables and tinning and bottling vegetables. And the farm got split basically between the two brothers and one went to Europe, the other one stayed on the farm. 
which is usual practice. The one that went to Europe was a bit of an investor. He now owns a castle in Lithuania and a game park in South Africa. But don't tell him I told you that. Another question, John. You live at the conflict islands or you live at Papua New Guinea? No, I, I would love to live in the conflict islands. You wait till you get to see it. I'm actually going to put a bid in and be the manager of the place. No. <laughs> No, oh, it would be, it would be, Conflict Island is a beautiful place. You can go there for a holiday, you can rent the whole place for a week, and you take 20 of your best friends with you, and it'll only cost you $50,000. For 20 people, that's not bad. And that's all for all your food, all your drink, and everything else. I, I live in Brisbane, and, but I used to live in Papua New Guinea for some time. So if you want to hear a little bit more about my life in Papua New Guinea, you can come along to the next presentation. One more question, that's a personal one. Yeah. I actually, since a young age, yeah. I met uh, actually a bird from Papua New Guinea in Belgium. Yeah. Uh, the zoo came out and I actually spoke to the bird, so understanding the bird language. Since that, the, the bird at the time said, what would you wish for? I said, I wish that I could live where you come from. And I ended up ultimately in Australia. Yeah. I ended up seeing the dream time, everything. I always put in the promise to the birds that one day I would want to go to Papua New Guinea and study to become a medicine man, to literally learn the bird language yeah. and to take it to the last level, which is actually the rainbow body, because paradise bird or bird of paradise yeah. is rainbow serpent with feathers. Yeah. And I really would like to go to the bottom of it. How do I go about it? Because on the rational level, people have told me, Elsa, don't go to Port Morrisby because she'll be shot. <laughs> so how do I go about making actually my dream for this life and actually a reality? You've got, you've got a couple of major problems there. Um, I'm not going to squash your dream. Two, two major problems. The first one is you're female. Yeah, but I can uh, see that as a problem. I can be well, anything you don't see, <laughs> see it as a problem, but there are problems in Papua New Guinea with females trying to do anything, never mind find out what you want to find out. And the second thing is you, with 850 totally different cultures, you're going to be hard pressed to pick the one that's going to be able to, to, for you to go and live with, to be immersed in it, to be able to learn what you want to learn. I'm not squashing your dream, but I would recommend that if you want to go there, that um, probably the Madang province, somewhere in the Madang province would be a place where you could go and hang out for a bit and find out whether or not you can actually achieve your dream. Madang with M-A-D-A-N-G? That's correct. Yep, Madang. <laughs> any more for any more? Yes? I love how the first talk and we're back for all of us, so thank you for being here. Um, I understand that we're, we're going on this cruise is very sort of undeveloped tourism is new, but I have read, I suppose, that um, the arson moves to have roads coming into that area and perhaps some of the troubles that we've been having with the wars, etc. We're a little bit concerned about what roads or uh, easy transport to that area might hold. So what do you, what are your thoughts about that? There, there, there are plans obviously to link as many places together as possible and they will eventually have a road that goes from Port Moresby to Alata. But they've, they've got a couple of mountain ranges to get over before that. And I think their priorities with the massive population in the highlands We've actually fixed the Highlands Highway because just last week it was closed for a week almost. And um, they've got a whole range of problems. As I say, Papua New Guinea is 42 years old uh, yesterday. And from nation standard, I think it's basically the same as a toddler. And it's not going to be until they actually get to 10 or 12 years old equivalent that they might have something sort of out. They've, got, they've had massive problems with graft and corruption. This new government that was elected this year, um, I, personally, I believe was a turning point in Papua New Guinea's history with the new parliament that they've got. There, there's a few people that are actually going to jump on the graft and corruption, which will mean 
that a lot of the money that hasn't been spent on infrastructure will be spent on infrastructure because it's not building condominiums and camps. I hope that answers your question. I've got a question. Um, yep. You said you left PNG in 1977 and ended in 1975. What did you do in that between period? Well, between 77 and now, or oh, between 75 and 77, I was I was working, <laughs> doing the same doing the same job. Yeah, yeah. Well, then you Yeah, yeah, yeah. We moved from an Australian contract into a, a, a Papua New Guinea, a Papua New Guinea contract. So I was actually employed by them. And one of the reasons we left Papua New Guinea was that I was working out where those guns of the weeks were. And uh, I, I believed I was doing a great job. They believed I was doing a great job. But the administration wanted me to leave the bush and go on to a major admin centre and become a clerk. And I thought, no, I can be a clerk anywhere. I'd rather work where I am. And they said, no, we can't extend your contract to work there. You can work there. So, you know, with a, with a brand new baby, I thought, OK, I'm going to have to leave that and give some time. So, off we went and jumped into the frying pan working for Aboriginal organisations. Yes? Hi John, I just wanted to know, is it safe and advisable for passengers to visit Alatar and Kutaba without taking a tour of the public transport buses? Yeah, the, the, the buses that will be picking up the tour groups from the ship uh, the local transport, so there's going to be very few of those around because they use them up to do the tours. In Alatau, there are um, the odd taxi, there are unofficial taxis, there are what they call PMVs, which is public motor vehicle, and um, there will be people that will offer to take you for a drive. But the roads in Alatau don't go anywhere really. Um, if you I'll show you. I'll show you. Show you. I'll just, here's one I prepared earlier. This this is a, a map of Alato. I'll just get out the way. Um, so we, if, if you can see the cursor here, we actually arrive at the wharf here. That's where where the ship pulls in, and to walk from there to as far as I would walk, which is to the markets up here. Oh, sorry, it's, the markets are in there. That would take you a nice, steady, easy stroll, probably 30 minutes. Personally, it, uh, what I recommend to people is that if they want to go for a wander, have your breakfast, leisurely get off the ship, go out onto the wharf, go up to the road, turn left, walk for half an hour until you get to the market, and then spend an hour, an hour and a half walking back to the ship. And that will, you will then see Alato, basically. To go to the lookout that the, that the, uh, the tour guide was talking about, you know, it, 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 it's at the top of the hill there. You're not going to walk up there, you'll be absolutely buggered by the time you get up there. Um, but there are, there are cars there, you can, you can go and make sure that if you, um, if you are going to jump in a, a car with anybody that you negotiate the price exactly for the whole thing, not per person, but for the whole trip, and don't pay them until they get back. Um, the, the, uh, what's available in Alato is far, far less than, than in Rabaul and Madan, for example. They're a lot bigger and a lot better developed, a lot more infrastructure there. But if you're, if you're leaving um, the wharf, I would say out onto the road here, straight up the road, to the marketplace. In the market, um, it's their vegetable market. It's not a, it's not a, um, a market for selling artifacts and things. Um, it's a vegetable market in here, and they've got two markets side by side. One sells uh, vegetables and smoked fish, and if you take a camera, because you'll see smoked bandicoots and smoked fruit bats and smoked fish, and if you feel like eating them big mud crab for five dollars and you can pick one of them up there and they've also got all the different kinds of greens and carrots and cabbage and stuff like that and next to it is the beaten nut market where they just sell nothing but beaten nut and 
Um, I'll tell you how Beagle Nut works, folks. It's a nut. It's like a mini um, coconut. But anyway, you take that up, you've got the seed in the middle, and they chew that. But they mix that with a with a uh, it's called mustard. It's a kind of pepper grows on a vine, long green pepper, and they get crushed lime. Now this is the lime that you put your mother-in-law in when you want to get rid of the body, right? That's the sort of lime that they use, and they lick the mustard or the pepper, and they dunk it in the lime, and they bite it on their back teeth, and then they chew the lime the pepper and the beetle nut together and that's what they get, the red teeth, the red mouth and then they um, they spit the, the stuff out and they try and tell people not to do it when cruise ships are coming in because it looks as though somebody's had a fight on the pavement and there's been blood everywhere but that's beetle nut spit it causes jaw cancer, tooth cancer every other kind of illness and ailment that you get so that's beetle nut, but that's the beetle nut market so when you finish with the bit, oops. When you finish with the the, big, the markets here, this little section here is the is the town basically the centre of commerce. There's the banks are there, and they've got a couple of ATMs if you want to try and get some cash over there. Um, and if 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 you want to see how the other half live, go into one of their trade stores or supermarkets. Just go for a sticky beak. And you'll see the sort of stuff that they're buying. You'll also see why I think that Papua New Guineans are going to have a real problem with diabetes later on. There's so much sugar there, it's unbelievable. Um, and um, in, in here you, you'll see lots of different bits and pieces. But um, there's a, the bank in uh, South Pacific Bank there, and Westpac Bank is up there. So on the way, coming back to the ship, um, there's a, a, a monument. When, when the ship docks at the wharf, and if you go up onto the top deck and you look across the town and you look diagonally to the left, um, you'll see what appears to be some flagpoles and there'll be a building there, and next to the building a hut. And next to that hut you'll see a, a blue tarpaulin or red tarpaulin or something like that. That is the Battle of Milne Bay Memorial is there. So you wander past there, and the, with the way the cloud is, you're going to be able to get some really good photographs of the memorial because if it's on a really bright sunny day and you stand in front of the memorial and take a picture, all you're doing is take a picture of yourself because it just reflects straight off that marble and you can't read anything that's on there. So just be cautious when you're taking photographs of the memorial to make sure you get a picture of the memorial, not a picture of yourself. Um, and right next to uh, the Battle of Milne Bay Memorial, is an arts and crafts place and that's where they sell billums and carvings and other bits and pieces there and that's the main sort of uh, area for selling that and over the years that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger so there's lots of choice there i'll show you a little tip in a second and then on the way back from uh, the, the market is here as you wander down here there's the alato International Hotel, which is a regular hotel. You go in there for a quiet, cold drink. And you, you can, in this hotel grounds here, right down to the city, you can take some really nice photographs of the ship from there. And it's, um, the manager of that hotel is actually a Cypriot. And we had our honeymoon in Cyprus. And um, we have a 49th wedding anniversary on Kirawina. Unfortunately, more ends in Brisbane and I'm in Kirawina. But anyway. um, so that's, that's the International Hotel. And you wander back down there, and then that, this is a, a little place that I highly recommend people going to, is the Waterfront Lodge. And in the Waterfront Lodge, it's run by the local, it's a local business, run by locals. They've got a big, like, big bally hut basically and in there the, the, you can get a cold beer if, you're, if you go there earlier you get a brilliant lobster dinner for 50 bucks and you get this full big huge lobster and lots of really really nice food you get a cold drink they've got a, like a string band playing there so they entertain you I'm trying to encourage them to do other things there as well so 
So that, that waterfront lodge was only opened, oh, less than 12 months ago. Um, but as you walk along, you see a big blue fence with really nice painting of, of uh, seascape scenes and reef scenes in it. Just wander down the pathway. Now they've got a little shop in there, and in that shop they sell things called Mary blouses, which is the traditional women's uh, blouse or skirt dresses that they made. Depending, uh, they're designed for the fuller figure. So um, if you want to check out check out the Mary blouses, then they should have a few in there for sale. And then basically to go from the waterfront lodge back into the ship, somewhere between three and five minutes. You know, you no nowhere is along there. But if there's you and two or three other people want to go and negotiate with a guy with a, a ute to go for a drive around the place, then go for it. There's not a lot of them. I say make sure you know exactly how much you're paying for the whole thing, not each person. They say it's fifty dollars and say, oh yeah, jump in and then it turns out it's fifty dollars each. And find out how much it's cost for everybody and then say, okay, we'll pay you that when we come back. And usually in a place like Alatoa, we're sophisticated enough to actually take Australian dollars rather than Kina. You go to the islands, take Kina, don't take dollars. You cause no end of trouble with dogs. Thank you, Donald. Very quickly, uh, I've heard that if you make an offer when you're trying to bargain with prices, that you only do that once, otherwise they'll take offence. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, what, what's happened is that the, the uh, I'll show you an example in a second. What's happened is that Papua New Guinea Tourist Promotions Authority has gone along and said, we're going to run these workshops and we're going to teach all these carvers and everybody how to negotiate and do deals and everything like that. So they say to them, oh look, you've got to have your best price in your mind when you actually negotiate. So you start there and you work to your best price. So you turn around and you say to somebody, how much is that? And they'll say, 100 kilos, best price 80. Bang, just like that. <laughs> so, but in Papua New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea, this is, this is the way it works. You've got small, medium and large. X, Y and Z dollars. You go to the, the beetle nut market, all the beetle nut is the same. Three beetle nuts for two kino, one bag of white. It's not cocaine, folks. It's lime. Don't try sniffing that or you, you'll die. So the little packets of lime are all the same price. A, a, a bunch of uh, bananas, a small bunch of bananas is a two kina, medium sized bunch, five kina, large bunch, ten kina, whatever. So you've got small balls, medium balls, large balls. So when you go onto the islands and you see hundreds of balls, find one you like and buy that. Don't wander around because they're not all the same, far from being the same, because they're all handmade. But when you see it, you know, the difference between 40 kina and 60 kina, 20 kina, 10 bucks. All us passengers that get off the ship, all the Papua New Guinea see is millionaire, 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 millionaire. <laughs> so, you know, save yourself the worry about negotiating. I'll show you something very shortly, what not to do, just to give you a tip. Yeah. How, how to, to the market, the fire end. Oh, the War Memorial? Yeah. It, there, it, it would take you 20 minutes at the most. It, and that's just a slow, steady walk. Uneven pavement. So make sure you've got good, good shoes on. Um, but, you know, you know, to get to the War Memorial, 20 minutes, but give yourself half an hour. You, you've spent a lot of money to come here. Enjoy it whilst you're here. Take your time. By the way, when you go out the gate, you'll find, um, well, you may find, I don't know whether they've tied it up, you'll find um, volunteers from the Tourist Promotion Authority that wear a yellow T-shirt, usually. And they're usually young ladies, and they're studying um, hospitality and tourism and things like that. You find a young lass there with a volunteer T-shirt on, make friends with her, and she'll escort you down there. On the way back, you might find you've got two or three little tights behind you saying, we will accompany you back to the ship. Thank you. 
Ah, oh, would you like an escort? Thank you. And these little kids are there, and by the time you get back to getting through the port gate, they're saying, we were very happy to escort you back to the ship. <laughs> and don't, please, 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 don't give them Australian coins. Because <laughs> it's the same as if you're in Australia and somebody gives you a 25 cent American coin, what are you going to do with it? Banks won't take it. You know, so, and they're in the same. So, so whatever you do, leave your Australian coins on the ship. Yeah. The, 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 um, the destination guy was, was very good at giving you what you can and can't take into, a, into Australia. All I would counsel you to do is if you buy a carving, two things. You, you'll see the carvings there, and I'll show you a picture in a minute. If it's jet black and it's heavy, I'll guarantee you that it's ebony. If it's jet black and it's light, I'll just about guarantee you that it's nugget or kiwi or whatever it is that they've used to actually turn rosewood black. Now, when you actually see the bowls and the carvings and things like that, have a good look, and if there's any tiny little pinprick holes in it, in there, just say thank you but no thanks and have it. You've got your sport for choice, so you'll be able to find one that doesn't have it in it. But if you find one that doesn't have it in it and there's a little dent somewhere, just run your fingernail across the dent and you may uncover a hole that's been filled up with sawdust. If you happen to have a pin with you and you pop the pin inside the hole, if it comes out wet, you know you've killed whatever's in there, uh, and leave it. If it comes out dry, you know there's nothing there. When you get back to Australia, they declare it to, to Border Force and, and they'll have a look at it. 99 times out of 100, they just let it go through. Sometimes they, they take it away for, for fumigation if it's in a real bad state. On that same topic, get to you in a second, on that same topic, when you get to the islands, they have woven mats, and they have woven bags made out of, of pandanas, not the string bags, they actually look like a nice little handbag, really nice. And they're made from the leaves of, of trees. As long as it's not green, in other words, it's not fresh material, you'll have no problems getting it into Australia. If it's got any green, if it's viable, if it can viably have beaten, bugs and things in it, then then they'll they'll do something about it when you get to Australia. Don't buy necklaces that have got seeds in them. They might have a combination of cell, shell and seeds necklaces. I've been trying to convince them to make just shell necklaces because the seeds uh, will get banned regardless little nuts and things like that, the, the customs will just take them off you. Whether they're viable or not, makes no difference. And if you go to the markets and you see, a lot of people collect shells, please, please, please do not buy Triton's trumpet shells. You know, the big shells that they blow in, they'll have them big and, you know, they'll have lots of different sizes. Please don't buy them because the Triton's trumpet is the only creature that eats the crown of thorn starfish. And we don't want their reef going the way ours has gone. So please don't buy them. The, the less people buy them, the, the less likely they are to fish them. It's one of the reasons why our barrier reef is screwed is because shell collectors collected it and, and shell fishermen went out to fish the place out. I think I've seen one in the last 20 years. But when a, when a fully grown a triton's trumpet gets into a starfish, it lasts about two seconds. We need more of it. We need the government to breed them. I'm just going to ask about donations. Um, you can take donations of different things to the different villages. Can you give us an indication of um, what type of things might benefit which village and um, where to take lots of things? Because there are lots of reading glasses and lots of personal um, hygiene glasses and things yeah. like that. This was where the best place to take, uh, you know, gifts and, and lights like reading glasses. There's some reading glasses and some personal hygiene products and things like that. Um, my 
personal recommendation is that if you're going on a tour in, in Alato with, with the likes of Ben or any of the private tours, then, then um, uh, Ben will be able to look after it and I'll make sure it gets to the right places. If you're going on a ship's tour and you've got stuff you want to give, they all got they go to, to um, a camera in high school and a couple of other primary schools. You may or may not wish to give them there, but that's your choice. Um, but you know that when it goes to those places, it stays there, and and because the ships tourists and everything go there, they tend to get a lot of stuff going there, which means that they probably have more than they need, and that stuff ends up in the market being sold. If it's being sold by a school teacher for cash and the cash is going back into the school, great. But like on Kirawina, the stuff goes to the school, the school teachers sell it and it goes into their pocket. So on Kirawina, for example, there's a lady there by the name of Lydia and she guarantees to get the gifts as far... When you get to Kirawina, you think, oh, isn't this quite a little thing? There's a whole island out there. There's 22 primary schools on that island. There's thousands of people who live there. They never come and, walk and see the cruise ships. So the people you're dealing with when you're there are, are the, the guys that have been given the carvings to bring from the other side of the island. There. The people, the women and the kids from the other side of the island don't come to the wharf. So it's mainly the people from that area, the, 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 the traditional owners in that area, that or at Kirawina. But to get the stuff beyond the beach, then there's a lady by the name of Lydia. You need to find her and get into her. I, I run a, a web page called, uh, not a web page, Facebook page called Cruise PNG. And um, Lydia gets photographs of the, the gifts going to all of these places and they post it on there. So she's guaranteed to get the stuff uh, far away. And as far as the glasses are concerned, um, Dan will be able to get them to the hospital in Alato and they'll get to the right people or Lydia will be able to get them to the health centre and then they'll just basically try people on to see if they're all through. But whatever you do, great. Thank you very much from them. Any more? Oh, uh, um, not having done it um, personally, but I'd, I'd say that you know you could probably you're, you're only going to be away for you know half an hour. If you were to go, uh, this is something you might like to say. Okay, you go and you see a guy who wants to take it for a trip around. If if you say to him, look, we just want to go up to the lookout, have a look, drop us in town, and we'll walk back then that'll give him the opportunity to take you up to the lookout, bring you to town, you pay him, he ducks back to the wharf, finds somebody else and maybe repeats the same thing. They're not taxis, they're not metered taxis or anything like that. But I don't know, I'll give him 40, buck, uh, 40 kino or something like that just to, to duck up to the top of the hill, take a picture and come back. He, he might ask you to keep him for an hour or two hours or whatever it is, your choice to negotiate a price, but please, as I say, try, try and pay, pay him in Kina rather than Australian dollars. Unless he's got a child in, living in Australia and he wants dollars and he can send them to a child that's at school in Australia. Anybody up there? <laughs> you have to yell. Uh, this is why the cruise ships don't, don't go to Port Moresby. Why, why don't they go there? Uh, well, there's some very good reasons they don't go to Port Why don't cruise ships go to Port Moresby? Uh, the first is infrastructure. They don't have a, a great deal of infrastructure um, for uh, lots of cruise ships. Some cruise ships do go there. Um, and they're the cruise ships that, um, that have all the tours and everything included in the price. So basically they, they, they take the passengers off the cruise ship onto buses and they take them to the museum or the art gallery or the, or the um, nature park or whatever it is and they have absolute strict control over the passengers. Nobody gets off a ship in Port Moresby and goes for a wander down to Cocky Market or anything like that. It's absolutely strictly controlled. 
mainly because of the population in Port Moresby and the fact that, that a good, um, I don't know, good 75% plus are unemployed and they have no cash and the quickest way to get cash from a rich person is to take it from them without asking. Yes? I'm an avid uh, snorkeler and I understand there won't be snorkel on um, when we stop at Alatau, but will there be a good and easy opportunity to go snorkeling at the other destinations uh, if I haven't booked the tour? Yes, most definitely. Snorkeling is on, snorkel on for young and old in, in uh, Kirawina and uh, hopefully we get into Katava. We get into Katava, uh, you, you get the, the, the uh, shuttle, shuttle, you get the tender, the tender onto the shore, and then you find a young lad uh, in a canoe and you give him five kina, or if it's two of you, ten kina, and he'll paddle you across to the little island. And then you go, go on the other side of the little island, it's a only tiny island, smaller than the ship probably, got the other side of the island, snorkeling there, the reef is right there, and that's fabulous. So it's five kina to get there. They charge a hundred kina to come back, but... <laughs> no, 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 no. Where was that again? That's at, that's at Katawa. But you get off and, and there's the, the canoes are there. If you try and swim, please, please don't try and swim from the, from the wharf across the island, because if you do that, you're going to end up in Rabaul. That's guaranteed. The current that runs through there is just absolutely amazing. So you, you pay your five keen and go across and have a, have a bit of a paddle over there. When you get to... Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll whip through these slides that I prepared earlier. There's only a couple of them. Um, here we go. Panacea Island. Now, if, if Ian Gary Smith gets on tomorrow and he does his presentation, he'll show this slide probably. Um, depending on which way the wind's blowing, We'll either get off the tenders here at the wharf and you can walk that way or this new pontoon that they've just built, which is a fabulous idea, goes out this way and that's the activity section. For you added snorkelers in the room to want to go for a wander, it only takes less than two hours to walk around the island on sand, so you don't have to panic about that. But go down to this point here on, the, on uh, the island, and at that point there's a really long sandbar. So drop your gear on the island here, this is where the turtles come in and nest as well, and uh, on there, and then just wander out on the sandbar until you get as far as comfortable as you can and then jump in for a swim, and, and you'll get the edge of the reef with a 400 foot drop off right there. Where's the sandbar in relation to that? Um... It goes, it's, ex, it's an extension of here. It, it goes out for, it, hopefully, if, if Ian comes on board, he'll show you some video footage and, and hear all the shots and some really nice, well, um, well-made marketing material. <laughs> so, so that's, that's um, uh, Conflict Islands. This is a billum or a string bag. I show you there, that's 30 centimetres long. They're all handmade, all the billings or string bags are handmade. So you're not buying something that's come off a machine and, and uh, um, mass produced. Um, so, and there's some more, there's some more billings here. Now this, this photograph is actually taken at the memorial in Milne Bay. And you, you probably can't see it, I don't know whether you can, but this, this billum here, this large billum, I'm sorry I'm getting in your way, this large billum here, that's a Highlands billum, that's, that's definitely from the Highlands, and that particular one had possum uh, fur woven into the string. When they made the string to make the thing, that, that women in Papua New Guinea have no, absolutely no hairs on their thighs or, or their you know, because they're just making string on them and they just, they exfoliate. <laughs> so, this, this particular one had, um, had possum uh, fur mingled in with the thing. Um, these are di different kinds. Now this, this is the interesting one here. This, this bill on the bottom left hand side, if you can see it. You see the bill in there. Now there, that one there has got a ticket that says 
100 kina, and that says 50, and that says 50, and that says 150. But if you have a good look at this little sticker, you'll see that it used to say 50, and they've actually written a one in the front there. So be careful. One other little tip is when you go down there and you have a look at these things, and you see these pieces of cardboard with prices written on them, be interested, bend down, pick up the tag, turn it over, and if it's got 20 kina on the other side, put the 20 kina one down and say, I'll pay you that. Because that's what they do. They've got the tourist price and they've got the local price. Uh, but um, that's, that's just, just be aware. But again, great place to buy Christmas presents for your family. And they, they can get a nice little one. This, this little one in the middle here is supposed to be the Papua New Guinea flag. Um, what have we got? Here's a, an example of a bowl, this particular bowl. And that's my hand holding onto the bowl. So I'll give you an idea. 60 bucks for that, handmade. It's all mother of pearl inlay. It, it's a brilliant job. And in here, you know, when I got it home and had a real good look at it, in here, that's actually concave in there. It's not as if it's got a straight side. They've actually worked it so that it's actually got a lip on the bowl, so that the whatever's in there doesn't spill over the edges. So that's a fabulous piece of woodwork. Here's some more types of, of uh, carvings that they've got. There's a, another big bowl. They've got these black ones. They, they, they won't be ebony. Ebony is a very thin, thin wood. They don't have big, fat lots of wood. That's why bagpipes are made out of ebony. They're long, long pieces of wood, thin pieces. Um, but they've been, they've been giving me all the nugget treatment. This, that's a map that I was telling you about, made from pandanus, uh, pandanus leaves. As long as there's no viable uh, uh, um, material there, it's not green, then, then feel free. But they've got everything there, little, they've got carved dolphins and masks and other old names, and up here is actually a mobile phone. <laughs> um, and what have we got here? Oh, this is something that I think that you should look out for on Kirawina and Kitava. This is actually a yam house, a traditional yam house, and it's very, very significant in that area. You, you probably won't see one when you, when you go on the island because they're, they're further inland. They belong to the women, and the women collect the yams, and the women are the most powerful. It's a matrilineal society on, on uh, Trawberry and Islands. And when you actually get there, you look at their features and, and the expression on their face, it, to, to us Westerners, it might look as though they're actually scowling, but that's not. That is actually their face, and it's, it's not as if they're frowning or scowling at you. It's just the way that the Trobrian Islanders are made. Um, but that's a yam house, and what they do is they carve yam houses out of solid pieces of wood, all one piece. So you've got all the, all the gaps in here, and it's a very fabulous piece of work. So if, if when you're there and you see these little, you can get a little yam house, that's a small, medium, light, as I said to you before. And um, if you want to take something home, you're never going to go back to Papua New Guinea again. You want something to put in your brag shelf, you say, I went to PNG. Get yourself a carved yam house. They're all got up here, it's all mother of pearl inlay and everything there. And that, that is, to me, that's one of the most significant things you could buy. A nice carved yam house. Um, this is a Kina shell. Uh, so the money's named after that. And um, you know we get told not to go across flooded rivers. This is what they're doing in again. This car was still driving. Right? It's still got a cross. This one stopped, so what they do, they pop the hood and get underneath, <laughs> and everybody's still in it, the back of the car. So they got it started and they came back again. So um, all this business about going across frozen, uh, flooded creek beds and things like that doesn't apply in Papua New Guinea. So, folks, if there are no more questions, if there are, please ask. We've got very little time left. Oh, our Belgic ladies come again. 
The bird you said before, the pitoi, the only poisonous bird in the world, in what sense is it actually poisonous? Can it bite you? Is it the feathers? No, it's all through the body. It's all through the feathers. The, the poison, just like the frog, the frog poisons on the outside, the bird is the same. Would it bite you or not? No, oh, if you grab all of it, it yeah, would. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't bite you like a snake. No, it's... it's and if we want to rent the uh, conflict island for fifty thousand dollars, who do we contact? Yeah, well, if he comes on board tomorrow, ask him. Do a deal with him. Who is that? Ian Gary Smith, the owner, is supposed to be coming on tomorrow. Okay. Supposed to be. Well, if he does, have a talk to him. He'll be more than happy to talk to you. Yeah. How many keeners in dollars? Two for one. Two keeners, one dollar. Well, there's a guy who come on board, um, as the, the, the uh, destination guy said this morning, us white fellas are called Dindins. And that Dindin is only in Papua, in, in, in the Milne Bay area. They don't call you Dindin in, in Madang. They, they call you white fella or dickhead, depending on what. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's a guy who comes on he, uh, in on the ship and he'll be there and he'll do the exchange and generally what he has he has little banked envelopes and then you give him fifty dollars he'll give you a hundred keener in an envelope and he just wants to get people moved he's he's trustworthy as far as that's concerned um but if you if you can't wait or if you're going on the the uh trip or you want to duck out if you duck out to um the waterfront lodge you go in there, and if you buy a drink or whatever and stuff in there, they'll give you a password for Wi-Fi. Um, but you go in there, well, they might charge you five keener for Wi-Fi access or whatever. But ask them to change your, your dollars, and they'll give you two for one at the waterfront lodge as well. Yes. Um, well, whatever takes your fancy. I'll tell you one thing, they've got the sweetest bananas in the world there. The, you know our lady fingers? They're even sweeter. Oh, brilliant bananas. You get a little pack of bananas with a couple of, a couple of keema. Um, you know, if you want to hoe into a, a smoked fruit bag, go for it. You know, I mean, I've eaten snake and possum and, you know, I've eaten just about everything. And, you know, when it's cooked and prepared, you've just got to be prepared that the following day you might end up needing a, a, a bump or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I got the question right, it's getting somebody to take you across the little island to do snorkeling. Yeah. When you finish, you just tell them you want to come back and they'll bring you back. No, they won't wait for you. They'll just come and go and come and go and come and go. Yeah. But they know that everybody that's gone there is actually paid. Yeah. So they'll bring you back. So you pay five, five keener and Yeah, you're five keener to get over and free to come back. Oh. Yeah, if it was me, I'd be charging 50 bucks to come back. <laughs> There's your boat there. They're going, doo, doo, doo. That's $100. <laughs> it, 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 Yeah, anything that's got border holes in it, forget it, don't, don't buy that. Nuts and seeds, anything that's got nuts and seeds in it, like necklaces, there might be a, a nut, a shell, a nut, a shell, don't buy those. Anything, anything that's got any plant material that could possibly have uh, an implication. Shell's not a problem, but don't buy Triton's trumpets. Anybody, look at this guy here, at the back here, if he's got a Triton's trumpet in his hand when he comes on the ship, Throw them off, all right? <laughs> yes. It, uh, this is a question about sea lice. It, it depends on the time of the year. If you if you get bitten or you get eaten by them, then, then get out. I, I was on conflict islands on the inaugural cruise. Went in there. And this young lad, it was an autistic young lad, he went in and he got stung by a blue bottle. And it was on for young and old. When he came out of the water, it was just really bad. And uh, we got him back around to the, the main centre and threw him in the hot shower. 
and that cured the whole well, it cured it, but it kind of developed for it. So just if you've got rashes or whatever, wear a t shirt. Yes? Crocodiles in Papua New Guinea? No, they've all eaten them. All the, all the, all the, the white pointers have got them. No, no white, point, no white pointers up there. I, we went to, um, and my son's a paleontologist, and we went to America, and, and he was, his, his sister-in-law who was a teacher, and she said, I'll come down to the school and talk to kids. So they did this whole program in, in the class about Australia, and they said, oh, this is a koala, this is a warm map, and I said, and Scott went up to the, the whiteboard and, got thing and he drew this map of Australia. And then at the top he drew this huge saltwater crocodile. And down the bike he drew this great big white pointer. And he says to the kids, he said, you know why the white pointers are down there and the crocodiles are up there? And he said, no, no, because the crocodiles have eaten all, <laughs> all the white pointers and the, and the white pointers have eaten all the crocodiles. So that's why you don't get them. Yeah. No, no problem, problem. I mean, you're in Madang, Weep Sepik River, whatever. You come and listen to my talk on me working up there, and I'll tell you a little story about crocodiles. Can't give it all away. Don't get paid for this. <laughs> any more for any more? I think we're about time's up, folks. All done, all finished. I'm an auctioneer. Done. Thank you very much indeed.